What's up, everybody? It's your boy Carcino here. Let's talk about it. The ultimate battle. <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne. Don't you dare call him Larry. <laughs> Versus Ike Turner. <laughs> Here we go. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> Ike, you got any messages? Man, the only hits I got is hit records. Nah, 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 nah. nah if, you, now if you're looking for a hit, I got it. <laughs> nah, 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 see? All right, Mr. Fishburne. <laughs> It's Lawrence. Okay, Lawrence, I would like to say I didn't like playing this man because I never wanted to play that type of person in my film career. It took a lot of mental sacrifice. Mental sacrifice? Man, you ain't had me at all. Tina, Tina ain't never with my ass in no back in no damn limo, man. Boy, you know me. What they made me do. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> here's how here's how this whole thing broke down. Okay. Because I want you to understand how crazy this was. So there was a book. In a movie coming out based on Tina's book called What's Love Got to Do With It? And once it was coming out and then they were going to make the film, they were trying to get the woman that was going to play Tina Turner. And Angela Bassett ended up embodying that role. Now, I think she did the Josephine Baker story as well. And she went from that to making history. Because she was incredible in the Josephine Baker story as we now move on to this. This became a cat and mouse thing when it came to the actual auditions. They knew who they had to play Tina, but who were they going to get to play the iconic Ike Turner? Spike Lee has suggested an actor to play the role of Ike Turner. Then there was an up-and-coming actor by the name of Samuel L. Jackson to play the role of Ike. Now, Samuel Jackson was already uh, contracted to do another film. And while he was doing another film, this was a starring role. So he was considered dropping out, but only if he was going to get the part to play Ike, you know, in the role. Then Samuel Jackson didn't have the name recognition that they were looking for that could push this movie and pro propel it to where they wanted to go. So they brought it to... Larry Fishburne, you know, because they felt like, well, we need to show somebody who's young and we can age him up down the road. Samuel Jackson, he looks the part now, but he couldn't play a younger version of Ike. He's a little too old. So Fishburne is perfect. But Lawrence Fishburne didn't want the role. 
He read the script and just like, nah, I don't want to play that. And they were like, had to convince him, even paid him more money to play this role. They didn't, they didn't put down exactly how they sweetened the pot, but they paid him more money to come in and take this role. So his agent, his management told him, this is not the role you turned down. A leading man role, you do not turn down a leading man role in Hollywood. This will be looked at against you and held against you. So he takes the role and he wanted to express how he didn't agree playing a man like this and then said, okay, well, I learned a lot more about the man. And then I said, okay, I could see what led to his, you know, downfall. But at first I didn't want to play a man like this, you know, on the silver screen, you know. And he never went into details why. Then when the movie comes out, everyone's saying, Lawrence Fishburne's, per Lawrence Fishburne's performance of Ike Turner is iconic. It was like watching Ike Turner on the stage. It was incredible. Everyone was happy. Except for Ike. Oh, Ike was pissed, pissed, pissed. Not only was he pissed off with the film, he was pissed off by the betrayal, <laughs> portrayal of uh, Lars Fishburne. No one had a counsel for the film. Like Tina was a counsel for Angela Bassett. Um, she could go back off of Tina, she needed to know some things. No, no one spoke to Ike. So this movie comes out. Ike is villainized through the entire movie, and they rarely shine on any of his greatness. It's all mirrored because it's all about Tina Turner's story. You find out he names her Tina. Tina Turner and everything else as he kept all the royalties, the rights to the songs that they had recorded and she was able to keep her stage name in the divorce for Mike. It was a volatile relationship. She left, went to court, did all she had to do and she went on to live her life the way she wanted to live it. Now, the backlash. Ike had deals in place with people he was producing, doing shows. Once the film came out, people didn't, they were distancing themselves. Record companies wouldn't even want to talk to Ike Turner about anything, about purchasing his music, the old songs, and the new stuff they were doing with his new artists, his new band. He was being blacklisted across the board because of the movie. Tina was doing interviews. She hadn't even watched the film. She said, I don't need to watch it. I lived it. So, Ike was being laughed at everywhere. Everybody was imitating Ike, talking about Ike. And... It was, man, I ain't know Ike was like that. They was like, man, Ike Turner was bad. And everyone was judgmental. So, Ike was pissed. Ike said, I'm going to make my own movie. And I'm going to tell the truth. 
I'm gonna make the Ike Turner story, and then you gonna know the real truth. So Ike wanted to tell his side of the story. Okay, YouTube just sent me something saying something crazy to me. I'll deal with that later. Now, my situation is a little bit different. I'm trying to figure out what it is that I'm trying to figure out where it is, what it is that draw people to make these conclusions that they be making here. This is nuts. So anyway, Ike Turner wants to make his own movie. And then Mad TV makes a skit. Like real little, you know, Little Red Riding Hood and Tina Turner's Little Red Riding Hood and Ike Turner is the big bad wolf and he's pissed off so Ike Turner went to the set and when Ike Turner went to the set There was a whole new movement that took place. Now, Ike, they decided to work on something with Ike and do a skit where the real Ike Turner shows up on the scene and just write it in. So now, they got a skit. The Little Red Riding Hood skit, you probably won't see it anymore. But this skit here, Orlando Jones was playing Ike. And they had a talk. And he told him how much he respected him. And he got him on TV to tell his side of the story and listen to him. And he told Ike told him, he said, when I do my movie, I want you to play me. You got Ike Turner blessings. I'm making the Ike Turner movie. You way better than that damn Lawrence Fishburne. <laughs> so, uh, when that went down, Ike Turner was at the... He was in New York, and he was at the theater house, I believe. I think he was doing something with the theater house. And Ike Turner was, like, in town. I don't know if he was performing, doing something. And Lawrence Fishburne was in town at some theater house. They, they were doing some um theater and he was there for somebody and they said i <laughs> lawrence fishburne is over there i turned their ears stood up like oh he is <laughs> so i wanted to come over there to meet him not to beat him up but to talk so that didn't go well because they went back to tell him they said hey man ike turner is here to meet you and they was like what they were like um yeah ike turner's here to meet you i have nothing to say to that man 
and refused to meet Ike Turner. So then Ike Turner said, I knew it. You ain't nothing but a B word. Yeah, so he was like, I ain't even come here for violence. I wanted to talk to the man so he could know the truth because he'd been lied to. And after all these years, we finally find out now today why Lawrence Fishburne didn't want to play that role. His uh, first wife that he had when he was 23 got married. His wife was 21. Uh, what's her name? Hannah Omos. So Hannah Omos was his first wife. And it was a violent marriage. He and they, they ended the marriage, but it was he was violent to her. She was violent to him. And he says he had anger issues and he had to go through therapy and coping, dealing with his triggers and dealing with the fact of playing while discussing playing his role as Ike Turner. He said and having some some experience with that as a young man, I did a lot of counseling. I found a great African-American th therapist who helped me deal with my anger issues because I had been physical with my first wife. I got married when I was 23 years old. My first wife was 21, and our relationship was very volatile. And I was physically abusive with my first wife to my regret and my shame. So I was very familiar with the territory and with the emotional landscape of what, you know, what brings a person to that place where they feel the need to be abusive to their partner. So he went to get help for four to five years. Now, he never mentioned this as the reason why he didn't want to play Ike Turner, but it had nothing to do with, I don't want to play a man like that. Based on Ike Turner, it was his own problems. But he shunned Ike Turner for trying to explain and talk to him about the reason he did what he did. You see, they never go to that to that that point of conversation. He wanted to just talk to Lawrence Fishburne. Ike didn't want to come there to fight. Cause Ike was wanted to tell him, you didn't know what it was like for me growing up. You know, my daddy, they beat my father down when my father was sleeping around with some woman he shouldn't have. And these white men beat my father in front of his house, stomped him so hard that they had crushed his intestines. They had my father in a tent in the backyard. He was so, he couldn't even go to a hospital. So he sat there agonizing in pain for days until he finally died from his injuries. And that's what Ike Turner had to see his father dying as a kid growing up. And he was surrounded by nothing but violence. And he was never that type of individual. All the women he dated prior, Ike Turner, never was violent. He was never that kind of guy. It's when he got deep into the narcotics did it take over with his paranoia and people leaving him and stealing from him. This was causing all of that to, and you know, the way the film made it, 
look, he just out of nowhere just turned and was like hiding this violent person he was. He wanted to talk to Lawrence Fishburne and have a conversation as man to man so he wouldn't forget all the greatness he brought in there as he was one of the founders in rock and roll. And later on, they actually put him in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Before he passed, he actually got into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. People tried to erase his memories of what he's actually done. And what he always said, and they always said, man, you got to at least apologize for what you've done. He was like, Tina was no angel. He's like, I don't want to tarnish her career the way she tarnished mine. But she was no angel. Now, there's plenty more I could say here. But I feel like that's for the Patreon. But now everybody's knowing the truth. Um, as Lawrence Fishburne opens up. I know why he didn't say it back then. Because it would have torpedoed his career. And his first wife could have easily done that. She could have destroyed his career. All she had to do was open her mouth and say these type of things. But even in a time of that, she was not the kind of woman to take another black man down. We know a lot of black women that have went through domestic violence and it's not even understandable as to why. But they take it and they was like, why did women take that and still move on with that man? I couldn't lay next to somebody because black women's mainly they sympathized with the pain that the black man was going through out in the world dealing with prejudiceness and racism and they can't fight back. They were saying, I know you frustrated at someone else and you can't hit them, you could take it out on me. That's how they mentally psych themselves up to accept that and keep moving. And saying, I still know you're a good man. Even though you're doing these heinous acts to me. And would still love them for it. And would still cook food for them. And I had to ask them, why? So, that was the answer. Most black women at that time, in those days, was like, what is a black woman going to do? I got five, six kids. I have no real job experience. How am I going to feed my children? So, yeah, he might go off the handle every now and then, but I need that man as much as he needs me. My children need him. He's paying the bills. Now, I don't agree with the level of, you know, disrespect that's going on here. But, you know, it's never one sided. It's always a side to a story. I don't agree with putting hands on anybody because it, no, it don't solve the problem. The problem still gonna exist. Whatever you was arguing about ain't gonna be resolved with a fight. So no one should be physically putting their hands on anyone. Especially when it doesn't resolve the issue. And I damn sure don't want to put my hands on anybody I got to sit next to or sleep next to when I'm at my most vulnerable. So.
on that note, I'm getting out of here. And the rest will be on the Patreon. And you're going to see why we did an S-curve around all this stuff. All right. Because I told you, we could say some things here, but we're going to have to go to the Patreon for that. I'm not getting sued all the way from my friends. <laughs> so don't forget, there's four more videos up here you can check out. Thanks for everybody who hit the like button, subscribe to the page. Shouts out there, Kwame Brown Bus Life and Kwame Brown Bus Life 2.0. Welcome to HD TV, Ticket TV, and everybody else out there. The Shade Room and um, who else? Uh, Damn D, Sister T, Queen Regina, and somebody I'm missing. The Star Report. Yep. Shouts out to the Star Report and One Crack News which is also myself. <laughs> I'm out.